The question now is like, why does it happen? Why do we see what we so should of this? Um, what we can see what's dominating nowadays like, is the concept of like design and reuse. Yeah? So this uh, IP-based system design, like building really proposal platforms out of IP that you buy by large companies like Arm, and so on, and all the others. Um, like everybody's used to like engineers. Like they, they want to build the extensions, they don't want to build the basic stuff. So they buy the processes, they buy the IP uh, for the peripherals. Um, and they want to build a platform out of it, or they want to make custom extensions at some point. Um, and also managers kind of they are really sold on the idea of IP based design. Nobody will start like an Intel processor from scratch out of right? Start sourcing your IP uh, in. So, as I said, like, you could focus on actual improvements, and um, the question is now, like, why, like, how can this be open, right? Um, and there's some, ben some benefits that we see of open source IP. Yeah? On the one hand, it's, from an engineering perspective, like, I'm also an engineer, it's much easier to integrate something if you have the source code, right? Um, of course, you don't have to look into it, but it's always helping if you can get a better, better understanding of what it works. Yeah? If you get an encrypted netlist, and something doesn't match your expectations, yeah, it's much easier if you can just sneak in and start opening a ticket somewhere and wait for four minutes to get an explanation of what's happening, right? But you have to decide that, you could just say, okay, take this basic block, yeah, let's say like where you are, and I just want to pump it to the limit, yeah, whatever that is for you are, but uh, you have the opportunity to improve it, right? You could say, okay, I want to make this custom extension, I want to build something into it that's, that's different, um, and then I want to differentiate. The most important thing for all open source and why it's successful in the end, right, in the open source world uh, of software, it's the collaborative uh, development, right? People are coming together from all different backgrounds, hobbyists, academia, and most importantly, it's a lot of large companies and enterprises, right, that contribute a lot nowadays to open source software. And this effort, like collaborative, uh, collaboratively um, working on a set of proven and valuable IP um, just because like that's the baseline that everyone has to have. Um, while I can still make my differentiating uh, uh, features on top of it, um, it's something very really different. Uh, overall, like, open source is not about free in the sense of it's free of charge. Like, it's always like opportunity cost. Like engineers, yeah, still somebody has to touch the code has to do something, has to improve, has to, to integrate it. Um, but anyways, there's some potential cost savings. Okay, you save royalty fees, um, you could save royalty fees on this, um, but you might still have to pay someone to, to support the stuff that you want in the office. 
So you could say, no, like, this sounds great, but why does it happen? And the reason is, like, if you have a design error, it's an irrevocable uh, property, right? So if you build an ASIC and some open source IP that you integrate it just kills the entire operation, you can throw it away, you probably throw away a few million dollars, right? Um, so that's, in our opinion, like, probably, as all of you probably agree to, the biggest problem to open source so, <laughs> um, so those are the those are some challenges that we identify as the most uh, most important ones um, on open source silicon. Why we still have the situation that it's not like something uh, if, you, if you're a startup or an established company would consider at first by right, taking open source stuff. Um, on the one hand, it's the reliability and trust and security. Right, in software, you know this Finnish DU Linux, yeah, he, he knows what he's doing. To someone trusting, right? Um, and you know it's, it's reliable in a way that Linux will still be there next year, probably. Yeah. So everybody can agree on that too. Um, if I just go on the internet and find some RTL code, uh, I don't know who's maintaining it, if it's maintained and so on. Um, that's kind of a critical thing for something that they want money in the end uh, for design jobs, right? Um, what we have is community is much smaller, right? So that's that's, for example, the branch you see many community, there's sort of software people that are coming in the idea of making um, like PCB design, uh, creating awesome new projects. Um, but the community of uh, like RTL developers that in their free time or at work do open source RTL is pretty small at um, And what you have to rely on, and this is like the same of course as for commercial IPs, like the verification is done. But if you buy it, you can sue someone if it's not uh, properly verified. Yeah, how can you trust a guy um, on the internet that you verified properly? How do you trust him at all? Um, you could pay a verification to yourself, yeah, and just verify it, and then give it back to the community, like some back fix and so on. Um, but it's still like kind of like a challenging situation for someone trading on so sort of right. Besides this, we have the, the ecosystem of business models, which are not like as established as in software. There's a lot of open source software companies that make a very decent living out of the fact that they support the open source ecosystem. Yeah? Because, as I said, just because it's open source, it's not free. Yeah? You're still paying someone to maintain it, for example. Yeah? So, uh, to get his, the server and so on, right? Um, but if you look like Linux, for example, is a perfect example, and maybe I can fetch it you. It evolved from hobbyists in academia. At the beginning, it's just like some guy spending some time in his room and just writing some operating system that nobody cared about. But then some hobbyists pick it up, then some academia pick it up, and now it's like 27 years later. And it's running like multi million dollar business dependent, on it, right? All the large cloud things nowadays, they're all based on operating system that some guys started with. And people at some point trusted it and they built like a powerful foundation around it and all this stuff, right? And finally, another challenge, which is not like Big challenge, but especially if you talk about the situation that's more eminent than like um, source code uh, in itself, in, uh, the copyright on it. Um, compared to software, well, patterns play a lot of uh, very important role in the semiconductor industry, right? Um, and there's something in the legal framework um, that's kind of challenging still. <laughs> so, there's another thing, this is kind of us, what drives us a little bit like doing Fossi Foundation as we do it. It's like, it's also like a cultural thing. If you think of, of hardware development, yeah, this is like, when I close my eyes and think about hardware development, I get this picture, right? It's some creepy um, user interface from, from the 80s and the options, like this is 2016, right? And the options that I have for source code management are stuff that I had to look up in Wikipedia to even know what it is, right? Um, not to speak of Git or whatever, right? um, but this is what you find out. This is what we work with every day. Yeah? And if you compare it to what software people do, like all this crazy stuff going on and all this tiny projects that just ramp up and immediately become large projects by many people just joining it, and very agile development science, if you like. Right? Um, so I'm not saying this is the way you should design RTR, but I say like it's kind of a different culture to approach the problem, right? And um, 
It's a practical situation where you look to study them. So the question to us is how could you improve it? And um, from the background, the Fossil Foundation is a, it's a non-profit organization registered in the UK, and it started from the open source community. And another open source architecture out there is not very prominent still, uh, but still around. And you know, like the history of open risk is strongly connected to the history of open cost of art, yeah, which is like the primary source still where we want to get open source solid. So there's a lot of RTO works there. But if you had a look at it for the last 10 years, nothing changed. It yeah, didn't improve, nothing was added, it was down for a week. Yeah, the software didn't start to running at all. And we were not happy, happy about it and kind of wanted to change, we wanted to contribute to it, but it's owned by a company. And this company is not very interested in the moment and driving it forward together with us. So we somehow came to the idea, okay, it's better to have something controlled by the community, they are not by a company anymore, and we want to start a foundation that properly, like it's, you want to be like the, the body that you go to if you have a question about also silicon, and we want to be the one that has a goal in the end, we want to have the community to build the high quality of social activity, yeah. so that's the, the overall goal. You want to see high quality of social IP happening, open source software systems, and, uh, for example, no risk to see today, and uh, the ecosystem like the age for quite a while. So we have three main activities. The one is the replacement that we propose for open cost work, is legal cost work. I will talk about it shortly. Uh, we focus on the licensing situation, which is a little bit fit for open source silicon at the moment. <laughs> and we do some community work for this trade. And um, what drives the was the yeah, idea like you need more collaboration, right? So if you have like there's many of open source RTL blocks, but if you look at it like the commit history, it's usually like one guy doing it, right? And you can always think like, okay, it's kind of risky to go that direction, so we have to build a larger community where people just collaborate with many different RTL blocks and everyone just commits back and has the idea that like participating in it creates a new value, right? And this is how we like design the process. This is the page we launched last year. It's kind of still in the, in the ramp up phase. Um, yeah, but the idea you can see already from the appearance is more the, like yeah, I want to get involved, I want to get stuff going. Right? As I said, it's on a heavy development. It's currently mainly basic features, but it's the project. What we don't do is code hosting because we believe this is what GitHub and Bitbucket and I think this, this is it. Um, I think like, uh, but they do very good, right? This is their business, and we don't want to mess with that. But they know what you want to do. What we instead want is like we present, we want to present metadata, right? Everybody's interested by like, how long is the project around, what's the license, yeah, um, what's the latest release, what happened after this release, how many um, open tickets are on this one, um, is there any test bench, how can I get started with it, right? This is a kind of information we want to gather. Um, for us, like the, the mindset that we set up set is to put the focus on trust. Like the system was the problem. We want people to trust, collaborate, integrate together on the uh, the that we have there. So as I said, it's fresh on the that we document yeah. So that's maybe the biggest hurdle. There you find outdated documentation if at all. Yeah, it should be properly documented. Are there many through a test bench that could start with like say, getting started guides, stuff like this? And most importantly, was it ever built amazing? This is kind of sometimes the best proof of when there's some products out there that actually use this block of IP. And there's, there are some success stories. They are here to bring people together to, to share those success stories, to, to get involved in those, like learn from them, um, and adopt it for their own development. Right? Um, those are all plans of 2017. That's the, the, we're currently ramping up in the cooperation of all those projects that we try to attract of it. Um, very much extensive tutorials about how to host your code, how to, <coughs> how to develop like, development flows should get a more modern touch, right? It's like the people are still used to clear case and CDS and stuff like that. They should learn a bit like how does collaboration in a worldwide community work, right? Um, they're giving some guidance licenses um, and what's our, like, our main focus is set is on quality. So you want to see like the commit activity of a of a keyboard. Yeah, you want to see like how often did it get changed last year? It's a good indication for it. Um, how many people are contributing to it? Yeah, if it's only one, it's probably yeah, we should have a closer look if it's like 20 people that constantly contribute to it, it's probably something very heavy, right? 
how long did the box live? Yeah, so if there are bugs that live there for six years, um, yeah, this shows you them in the order of the, of the age, and I will make my own figure of it. Um, so yes, probably generate some metrics in the end for people. Um, plus, one of our foundation directors, he's the working packet manager for RTL design, so it's kind of like um, the yeah, attitude of RTL and we have like kind of API where you can automatically fetch all the stuff. So you describe your top level and then it just fetches all your people of the and puts it all together for you. Um, and one of the things for us is like the best proof that your code is doing good is just to showcase it, right? And you want to have like some kind of like, testing what you do there is continuous integration. And this is one of our main efforts on the legal course like beside the actual website. It's a little course CI, and we have one of the Jenkins contributors who uh, spend some time um, on legal course CI. And those of you who don't know it, like generally the idea is you develop the code, you upload it to your repository, and something is triggered, right? And the something is a legal course group to put into integration, a legal course CI instance, that just like has an understanding of what to do next. And yeah, there was an automated test, and those tests are usually kind of like a linter, then you have the next step, kind of simulations, unit tests, and stuff like this. Um, but one thing we are very proud of is the work we could do with this on the FPGA. And so the idea that we have here, and, um, we want to invite people in the next year to continue to or like participate, um, is just bringing your FPGA to a cloud thing, right? Um, so the idea is we probably have some like mainline like Nexus or the RT boards or client boards ready in our cloud. But you could attach your own to it. Yeah? You could just go and open executable, like it's a Docker container that you run on your machine, you connect your FPGA board to it, and you could just like, donate it temporarily as long as your computer is fired up to run automated tests for other projects. So then on the web interface, you could select like you want to do it for all projects for the FPGA, or you want to limit it to like your own projects, or like a selection of projects that you made, or only matching some common like filter. Um, and um, yeah, but just we want to attract more people, like this whole bringing on device thing, so you write on tests, like you get some kind of motivation of writing tests by, by seeing it happening, by only downloading a Docker container, connecting the FPGA, and suddenly you see an you know, the and it's doing some tests that you worked right. Um, and in this we see like a very good lead um, to, to get people and used to the idea, like in industry, everybody knows that you have to. Yeah, uh, because otherwise you do. Yeah, but it's a hobby, yes, also in academia, it's, it's more than one half of that. And you want to make it really easy, the project, um, so you have this kind of declarative statement that you write how your test should look like, and it will run it simulations for you in our cloud, and it will run maybe our FPGA, and it will run the test that you want. So that's our work on course, and the topic Probably everybody is thinking the first if it's about open source as uh, the legal stuff, right? So licensing is like the area of most confusion, I would say. Like people have a like have a very good misunderstanding of licensing usually. Um, so open source software licenses nowadays, I would say they are established, like companies got adopted to it, like in each legal department of a larger company there's somebody who knows how open source licensing works in software. But there's none who knows how open source licensing for the Silicon Works or for other hardware, for PCB. Um, so it's still like, um, it adds up to the problem that open source software licenses are not so easy to transfer usually to, uh, to hardware. And I'll talk about it next slide. So what we have is a, it's a licensing committee that's not only by us, um, so we have some legals uh, as doing their part time for bono, that. Um, that help us like claim integration. Yeah, there's a kind of like there's many licenses out there and there's like a solution for everything, but we see that they don't really fit everything at the moment. Um, and you might end up like with a situation that you probably won't be able to so you can just because you don't trust the license. But right? um, what you want to do again is you would recommend like, a set of three license types, uh, like for three licenses that you could have, like some some sets that we could recommend for users. Uh, besides, we already published some articles about uh, 
part of the web page, uh, so silicon licensing. Um, yeah. But it actually is like licensing, you shouldn't see it always as a legal thing. And that's the um, that's the thing that maybe is the problem for most people. Like they always think like, oh I need a lawyer, uh, licensing is complicated and it's it's against me. Yeah, but it isn't. It's just like it's a contract that you make how you work together, right? And you should approach it from the from the view what's the intention of the of the person like in the art here and um, um, yeah, how can I fit in this? And uh, that's usually like the distinction is permissive versus copyleft in software is the same for hardware. Um, we copy left here, we strong copy left. So permissive, you essentially say that everyone can do whatever they want, and usually they should just give you attribution that, um, that you provided the, the starting point. Right? But they don't have to give the source code if they, uh, if they build something commercially about it. So it's just like free to use value. Um, in software, it's well known like the BSD, the MSD license, the Apache license. Um, you can find a lot of projects using those. And for open source IP, it's kind of ready to use. Yeah, the only thing that you could work on is the solar paid hardware license, um, which adds some specific wording about silicon, yeah, which makes it a bit easier, but it's more like it's like an Apache license plus an appendix that just says you have to understand like the word program as is it, right? And um, it's more like a translation layer. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit more complicated for copy left, actually. Like it's, the problem is a little bit like, so in weak copy left, to strong copy left, but in weak copy left, the idea is the intention that you have is for, I give you my source code, you can use it, and, but if you ship it to someone, you have to give them the source code, or if you make modifications, you also have to publish the modifications, right? Um, everything else you don't care about. Um, so it's LGPR and Cilla license. Things. Um, in strong copy left, instead you say, if my code is used somewhere, I want to get the whole program. And this is the GPL, like the standard GPL. And for open source IP, the, the critical point is actually like where to define a boundary. And yeah, it's the same for software, of course, like there is kind of a library concept and a program concept. But in open source IP, it's like where do I draw it? It's not only, it's like, not only horizontal, it's not like the how far my ship does it go, because there's always a question like if I have some, some very low code or some physical code, it may be synthesized to some very complex, and how it was synthesized may be under some pattern, and it may be something that the, that the tool vendor doesn't want the other people to get hands on, right? Or it could instantiate some, some exciting as DSPs, for example. Like this is, and I, I don't have control over the source of DSP, so this is the horizontal problem. Right? What you could do maybe is kind of send a file on it, for example. Um, but the other thing is also like the vertical problem. Where, how deep does it go, the, 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 um, my, my IP, like, does it affect the mask, do I have to give like, pictures of it in a higher resolution, or yeah, is it like the system libraries, are they affected, do people have the right to see the S2, and uh, like, those are the two dimensions, and we just have to figure it out, like, uh, how to define boundaries properly, yeah? because GPL as a software program, yeah, it talks about system libraries in the sense of something that's running on the PC, it talks about programs, it talks about source files. We just have to find some translation and find a way also for people to, to be a little bit flexible in how to define boundaries and, and to extend it in the, the horizontal direction of the whole chip, for example, or just limiting it to source files and uh, just clarifying. So besides this, like, the last thing that we do is a community events. Uh, one of those events you attend today is uh, some kind of like tutorial style or talks that we want to uh, present more and uh, actual highlight and one of the things that we did from even before we started the foundation is the OrgConf, it's the Open Risk Conference, but it's just the name, it's not about open risk anymore, it's about open source and uh, embedded systems, uh, also embedded systems uh, like system software, open source software and open source EDA. It's it was started as like an open risk meeting in 2012 and in 2013, it was in Cambridge, and 2014 in Munich. We still had like 25 to 35 people, but then, like, the last year, we were at the end of Geneva and CERN uh, together with this five, and then um, we included more people from the global community, and last year, Bologna. And, um, yeah, if you don't have plans for holidays already, like, 
This is a pretty nice place where we have it this year. It's a uh, Hampton Bridge in Yorkshire in the UK. Uh, it's part of a, of a larger festival. It's like a week, you know, 10 days long. It's a moving bike festival. Um, yeah, there's like a lot of like hackathons and like tutorials for newcomers to FPGAs. There's like um, the GCC user group meeting you know, going on. It's all during like, 10 days and on the event like in the middle of the, of the weekend, which is uh, September 8 to 10, uh, we will have the open event all Yeah, so the last question that you probably have is like, oh, this is pretty awesome and I went here today, I want to learn more and I want to get involved. And, um, I have so many ideas. And, yeah. First thing is to talk to us later, just have a beer and, uh, and a snack and start yelling at me why this is not so complicated. Um, you probably already did, but you should visit our website and look at stuff that we publish, we put people's directions. Uh, join our mailing list, get in a discussion. Yeah, most important, you have to contribute, and that's the best thing you can do, like just to make the community happen and um, be part of it. And, yeah. Last but not least, you can always talk Sponsorship. So, industry people here I see, um, we have very attractive sponsorship. Yeah, thanks a lot. Let's talk. You can find the slides online later and yeah, just get in touch with me on the channels of your choice when you post for today. And yeah, have a great day. It's nice that you're here.